There's no lack of property-specific data or information out there. In the blink of an eye, and occasionally with parting of a few dollars, you can locate capital growth information for states, for cities, for suburbs, for streets, individual houses. You can calculate auction clearance rates, number of properties sold, vendor discount rates, rental yields, vacancy rates, demographic information. However, with this increased availability and speed of data, there's also the new challenges that this brings, not the least of which is making sense of the tidal wave of information. Investors also have to decide whose figures to trust. Just take a look at the report from the major providers of the data and you'll find different figures on most property statistics. But there's a reason for this disparity, and it's not because one provider is more accurate than the others. They tend to get their numbers from the same sources. It's just how they interpret the numbers, how they analyse them, what they do with them that makes one different to the other. And, of course, it's important to look at trends, not just figures in isolation, to see what's happening over time. So in today's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, I have a chat with my business partner, Kate Forbes, National Director of Metropole, to discuss how to interpret data. That's Kate's area of expertise and specialty. So, Welcome to today's episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialise in helping you grow, protect and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's most trusted property commentator who has once again been voted Australia's leading property investment advisor. That's the fifth time he's won a similar award in the last seven years. Over the years I've been investing, one of the big, big changes is the amount of property data available. When I first started investing, there was very little data and there was a long lag, often a year, before you knew what was happening to property prices, unless you were on the ground. Today, the availability has reached unprecedented levels and at times that causes more problems than it helps. Now, property experts have always used data to help them identify what we call investment grade locations and then the right properties within those locations. But How do you decide which bits of data you should be paying attention to and what weight do you put on different parts of the data? That's what I'm going to be discussing today with Kate Forbes, National Director of Property Strategy at Metropole and a very experienced property investor herself. Welcome, Kate. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. Now, the problem with all these statistics is they can tell you anything you want, can't they? You can almost read whatever you like into the data, Kate. You can torture the data to say anything that you want it to say. And then we've also got our own biases. So even where it, when it isn't saying that, we're going to be placing an emphasis that wasn't there on it. Well, let's look at some of the common data metrics that comes out, and I'd love to take your take on it because you're head of research at Metropole and do a lot of research. I know you've looked back over the last 40 years at how various markets have been performing, um, how different states have been performing, but what are the most common bits of data that's reported to medium prices? How important is that? How significant are they? It's, it does seem to be the holy grail that um, a lot of other people place a significant amount of stock in, and it's a very widely reported figure. It's also one that a number of different houses will record or calculate differently. So it's important that if you are actually looking at a medium price, that you're looking at it consistently from the same source, or at least comparing apples for apples. But it might be useful to, I guess, have a look at what is a median price. And it's basically just that uh, that house price that's smack bang in the middle of all of the sales that have been ranked from highest to, or lowest to highest. It's the middle one in there. And it's probably more of an indication of what's actually going on in that market than in a, a movement of prices per se. Because if you've got a whole lot of first home buyers or low entry point buyers coming into the market, at a particular time, they can pull down the median price based on where it was before. Conversely, 
it can move up if you've got a lot of high end stock selling at a particular time. Across all data points, it's more useful to, I guess, bear in, in mind that you need to look at the trend. And back in the trading days and the floor, we would have said the trend is your friend. Keep an eye on that. <laughs> yes, well, you've come from a background of uh, equities and working in some very, very big firms as well, but that was years ago. Now, so what you're saying is median prices is telling you what's happened recently and it is one of the indications that people do use to see well if the median price in a particular suburb has grown over the last years they think that means capital growth of all properties but that's not actually true is it Kate? Definitely isn't true um, most often it isn't true it's it's just a movement of that middle point. So median prices are important to look at you just have to understand what they are telling you and put them into perspective. Okay, another factor that we like to look at is supply and demand because it's often said that it's really supply and demand that affect property values. So what factors in supply and demand are you actually looking at? Yes, supply and demand's a relatively self-explanatory category. Essentially, you're looking for uh, how many buyers are there relative to the amount of stock that's uh, on the market, or conversely, what are those listings relative to the number of people who are actually trying to purchase properties. So it's an indication of where the mi market might be heading in that particular location. There are a number of data houses that give us the amount of listings on the market. And over the last year or two, the number of properties for sale decreased and they're increasing again. But it's important to understand a number of factors with regard to the number of properties listed for sale. First of all, how many new properties are coming onto the market, which is an indication of vendor confidence. Also, how long they're taking to sell, which makes a difference as well. So if there are a lot of listings, but they're old listings and taking time, that's not a good sign. Um, on the other hand, if days on market, which is calculated by the average days it takes a property within a particular category, whether it's houses, apartments, pavilions, advertised for sale, to, if it takes to sell, th that's, that's an important indicator. So I like looking at days on market, Kate. Days on market, it's, I guess, one of my favourite ones uh, for an odd reason. It takes me back to those awkward school social days when um, when I was a young teenager, it was important that you weren't standing on the sidelines waiting for somebody to ask you to dance. So <laughs> it's... Um, <laughs> but I bet you were asked to dance. I was the one on, on the sidelines sitting there, Kate. Um, well, whilst I certainly did have a, a number of offers to dance there, I was always um, also confused about whether I was the, the loser for turning away those initial offers and still sitting on the sideline <laughs> rather than being out on the dance floor and having accepted the first offer. So <laughs> there's a number of, um, I guess, tied backs to the, the market here. But you certainly didn't want to be the one sitting on the sidelines for long. And just with property, the number of, of days that a property has been on the market is an indication of the amount of demand for it or um, perhaps that it's uh, got some issues or maybe even not priced correctly. So with that, and these are conditions that are specific to a certain property or a certain market, they're a point in time rather than um, something that is necessarily indicative of longer um, relationships there. If it's taking longer for a particular property to sell, it could be a sign that it's a softer market, there's not as many buyers, or of course it could be related to a particular property where the vendor has not priced it correctly. But Kate, like other factors, it's really the trend of days on market for whether it's apartments, houses, townhouses, villains in a particular suburb that we're looking at, isn't it? It is indeed. I also would caution with this particular one to be really careful about not just looking at days on market as an indicator of perhaps a location to go to. I'm sure if you look at um, mining towns in the height of the, the boom, the days on market for those areas would have been really small. Does that make that a, an investment grade location? Absolutely not. That's actually a really good point because what we're talking about at the moment is 
finding out what's happening on the ground in the market in the short term. But really, I know where you and your team come from is before we even do that, we have a much bigger picture view of how markets have performed in the medium to long term and what we see going ahead. So that, that's a good point to understand that the data we're currently talking about, are the metrics we're currently talking about, are giving an indication of what's going on. If I could... Um just give a another throwback to trading days you you wouldn't choose what to invest in based on um market timing or days on market or anything like that you would look at uh, the fundamentals of a stock just as you would look at the fundamentals for for property investment using your top down approach when it comes to then deciding the timing of that particular investment, having chosen the locations and things, then you might look at some some of the data that we're looking at in terms of, of deciding the specifics of that timing. Good point. In tandem with days on market, though, I like looking at vendor discounting. When there are fewer buyers out there looking for property, then there are properties for sale in a buyer's market like we had a year or two ago. Vendors usually need to discount their asking prices to secure a buyer. But Kate, there's another market indicator that uh, most people never, ever mention. And I know you'll understand this well coming from many, many years ago of your equities background, and it is market depth. Market depth relates a little bit back to the vendor discounting side. You would need to have discounting happen if there was a significant amount of market depth in there. And that essentially, if you look at market depth, it's it's the number of people standing in line behind a transaction if it were to, to fall over that would then be there to say, me, please. The more people that you have looking for one uh, particular thing, the greater the market depth there. I think a good example of this is for a while, Hobart was in fashion. It was a hot spot. And to be fair, it was actually a very strongly performing market. But in the whole of last year, there were just over 5,000 transactions in the Hobart property market. On the other hand, Melbourne and Sydney had more than 10 times that many. Now, sure, they're much bigger cities, but the concern is that a swag of investors chasing the next hotspot in a market which hasn't got a lot of depth of properties for sale or homeowners or lo- local market buyers either there can move the market in one direction, but when they move out, they, they move it very easily in the other direction. The number of transactions definitely does feed it through into, I guess, the integrity of the data that you're looking at. It is very easy to sway the the numbers when there aren't a lot of, um, I guess, numbers going into your your calculations there. So stay away from your markets which have um, few transactions in them. Sure. And again, that's why sometimes regional areas look on the surface of things good, but uh, when the economy slows down or their particular economy slows down, there isn't much depth there from, and we like depth from owner-occupiers, not from investors. When I think I have to remember that 70% of the market is owner-occupiers. As investors, we tend to think about investors, we tend to think about tenants, we tend to think about rental yields, but if there's market depth from not just owner-occupiers, but more affluent owner-occupiers who are going to be there when interest rates go up, when interest rates go down, when the economy slows down a bit. That gives you more stability in the market. Your owner-occupiers don't panic when the market goes down. They're not selling when the market goes down. It's only your investors. So we we do like to focus on those markets where there's a predominance of owner-occupiers in there. And as Michael said, affluent owner-occupiers. Now, rental yields is something a lot of investors look at as well. And I can understand why they need the rental return to pay the mortgage. But how important in your assessment of an area or a particular property is rental yield, Kate? It's important for the reasons that you've said that we'd prefer to focus on capital growth to the extent that is possible, because that's what's going to benefit you the largest. But um, on the yield side, 
it is becoming more important these days to focus on yield than perhaps in the past because um, in order to get finance through on the investment side, the banks are often demanding higher yields out of in order just to get the loan. So in the past, we may have placed more emphasis on capital growth than, than yield, and, but now it's, it's needing to be a little bit more at the forefront. Well, as I've often said, cash flow keeps you in the game, so you need it. Capital growth gets you out of the game. So I don't think we should downplay rental yield. Of course, the challenge at the moment, in, particularly in the very strong markets of Sydney and Melbourne, is as property values go up, the yield goes down. So remember, rental yield reflects the average rental for investment properties in a specific suburb. Um, so it's really a proportion of uh, the, the value of the property, which is a bit different to the total cash flow, of course, isn't it? Yeah, and it, it, it's a point in time calculation. You're, as you said, your, your yield will change as the, as the value of the property changes. Of course, one of the most commonly mentioned statistics, metrics, is auction clearance rates. And that's particularly relevant in Melbourne and Sydney, where in the inner and middle ring suburbs, a large percentage of the properties for sale go to auction. About a third of the properties that go for sale go to auction in Melbourne and Sydney, much, much smaller percentages in the other capital cities and a smaller percentage in the outer suburbs as well. So auction clearance rates are a useful in time metric of how the market is feeling, um, supply and demand, buyers and sellers' emotions for particular small segments of the property market as opposed to in general. But Kate, a few times we've mentioned the concept that what we're talking about now are the, the things that are in the back of the magazines or on the websites and the metrics that are relating to a specific small market segment or a particular property. But you've said a few times, we've really got to go back to the big picture and the fundamentals. And that's where we really start. You absolutely need to, particularly with property, more so than any other asset class, because it should be a long-term investment. The figures that we're seeing for auction clearance rates now are incredibly different to the same time last year or to five years ago, they they and the other data points all fluctuate hugely. That is why you need to look at the, the trend and to make it your friend, uh, as I say. But it's also really important before you start looking at these finer data points to keep that big picture in mind and to look at the fundamentals as it applies to at, at a macro level to the markets that you're you're looking at only then can you drill down into the the minutia of these data points um, to I guess cherry pick what you're looking for within those larger markets great so trends are important specific figures in isolation don't mean much start with a macro picture of what's going on in the economy, what's going on in the general market where you're looking, what's going on in the suburb, what's going on in the street, and then work down to property. And if you don't understand what all these data points, these metrics mean, get somebody who has access to this information, but more importantly, perspective to interpret them on your side. It's too hard sometimes to do this on your own. And that's what Kate's team at Metropole does. If you're looking to buy a new home, if you're looking to buy an investment to take advantage of these rising markets, why not have a chat with Kate Forbes or her team? Have a look at our website, metropole.com.au or give us a call at 1300 Metropole. And there's a number of ways we can help you. You may just end up after a chat with one of her team getting one of our books, one of my books for free. That's all some people need. Other people need a strategic portfolio plan to bring their future forward and plan and understand what their uh, goals are mean, what they need to do to achieve their goals, and are they realistic? Others use our buyer's agency service, our wealth advisory service, property management, renovations uh, services. So have a look at what we can do at metropole.com.au. We'd love to be part of your wealth creation journey. Kate, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure indeed. Thanks, Michael. Now here's Michael's mindset message. 
Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In today's Mindset Moment, I'd like to talk to you about the secret of enlightenment. Hey, don't get too scared. Stick with me. Because the concept of this came from a blog I just recently read from Carl Richards, who's a great financial planner. He's written the book, The Behaviour Gap, and his blogs are often on property updates. He's a great student of behavioural finance, what makes us do what we want to do. Now, these podcasts are a lot about property investment, but they're really about success, financial literacy, and also you developing financial freedom. So anyway, back to Carl Richards' blog that started off saying that this is one, that particular one was for yogis, media, meditators, and Buddhists out there. He said, do you want to achieve enlightenment? Well, he explained that the key to enlightenment isn't green smoothies, but it's budgeting. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but he went on then to say that Tik Nat Nun said budgeting leads to enlightenment. Well, he was only kidding, because he didn't say that at all. Tik Nat Nun said, awareness is like the sun. When it shines on things, they're transformed. And I guess as any good scholar of Buddhism knows, that awareness is the key to enlightenment. So, Carl Richards went on to say, what better way to become more self-aware than by budgeting because really at any level money management is important if you're a beginning investor you need to save enough money to be able to get the deposit to buy a property if you're an experienced investor already if you're in the game you're still going to need money management to make sure that you can stay in the game during all the ups and downs and as a advanced investor money management living off your investment properties is also important so anyway back to what carl richards was saying that budgeting knowing where you are in your financial situation is important because money creeps into almost anything in life doesn't it so being aware of your spending is one of the most powerful tools you've got of being aware of yourself and budgeting is really just being aware of what you're spending Now, I don't run into too many people who like budgeting. And when it comes to co-budgeting, budgeting with your spouse or your partner, there's a good chance that at least one of you is actually going to hate the idea. But really, this is a marketing problem. You see, budgeting is a bit like dental flossing. We understand how important it is, but it's not something many of us like doing. We don't like thinking about it. We we tend to lie to our dentists, don't we? We often say we've done it and promise to do it better and then skip the next day you don't continue doing it do you or you do it for a little while and then you stop anyone who takes the time to think about it would agree that spending money in a way that's more aligned with your values is likely to bring you more happiness of course the only way to know if you're spending aligned with what you're doing is to keep track of it tracking it is going to make you aware of where your money is going how it's spent and it'll give you the information you need if you need to you need to make some changes. So why aren't more people budgeting? Well, according to Carl Richards, one of the reasons is because it's not fun. Now, that's true. But remember Stephen Covey, you know, that guy who wrote Seven Habits of Successful People? He said, if the ladder isn't leaning against the right wall, every step we take just gets you to the wrong place faster. Budgeting is how you make sure your spending ladder is leaning against the right wall. That makes sense. Carl Richards gave a couple of other reasons why We don't budget. Some people say, oh, look, I already know where my money's going. The answer is, no, you don't. Sorry. Unless you keep track of your spending, you probably don't have a clue of where your money's going. Everyone I've seen, when you talk to them about the process of their money tracking for 30 days, usually ends up with a version of, oh, I didn't know I spent that much on. It's often cigarettes or alcohol or entertainment or Uber Eats. And I guess the third reason a lot of people don't budget is, that they don't really want to know. Now, that's probably one of the biggest mental hurdles. The reality is that you, once you become aware of where your spending is going, you're going to be surprised by it. You may even be bothered by it. And then you've got to decide, do you want to change? Now, of course you want to change. Part of the reason you're listening to this podcast, you're reading my blogs, is because I know you want to get to the next level. So why not try keeping track of your spending for 30 days? Don't stress what app you're going to use. There's lots of apps, but you could just go back to the simple notebook and just keep a track of money that's going on or a simple spreadsheet. And the end of the month, go back through your notebook, through your spreadsheet, through the app, whatever, and just become aware 
That's it. That's all I'm suggesting you do. What have you got to lose? Remember, a budget's telling you where your money goes instead of you wondering where it went. If you want to take control of your cash, if you want to have a level of cash management, there's only one answer initially, a budget. Now, if you want to look in the long term, though, what you've got to do is figure where your money's coming in, where it's going out every month, and then this isn't a one-time thing. You've got to keep doing it in the long term. But if you don't have a plan, it's a bit like living on a prayer. You're hoping everything's going to be okay, but not actually doing anything about it. And that's not going to work. So you've got to stop hoping. And you've got to start planning. In order for a budget to work, you've got to then start living according to your numbers. So you start off by looking at the budget, looking backwards to see where the money's gone. But to me, a budget's then looking forward as to where you're going to spend it. So forward looking, I'm going to spend this much on entertainment. I'm going to spend this much on fun. You're allowed to do that. A budget doesn't mean you stop spending on fun things, but you also have enough set aside before you have those fun times to keep growing your asset base, to save a deposit, to invest in property, and also to understand where your cash flow is going so that you don't get caught out at the end of the month. So maybe budgeting is the secret to enlightenment. Well, that was a very numbers-driven show today, wasn't it? But data and statistics are important. And to become a successful property investor, you need to have the blend between big picture and also detail. Now, some of those things you can, of course, outsource, and we'd love to be part of your team to help you understand how to interpret data, because with so many sources of information, how can you be certain that you're taking into account all the right information, and how can you be certain that you're interpreting it properly, putting the right perspectives. And at Metropole, we weave the perspectives into your strategic property plan when we create one for you, and then we help you implement the plan. So why not have a chat with my team at Metropole, metropole metropole.com.au, or give us a call at 1300 Metropole. Now, if you enjoyed today's show, if it's helped you understand a bit more, if you got some benefit from it, please tell somebody about it, because my aim is to make as many people as possible financially independent, to help them get the success and the financial freedom they deserve. So tell a friend, pass on the message through social media, or leave a review on iTunes or Google Play or wherever you listen to this one star, five star. I don't mind. Just tell us what you think. I'd also be keen to catch up with you in between these twice a week shows through social media just chase me on any of the social media platforms you're on at michael yardney and i look forward to being back with you again real soon in the meantime have a great week make it a great week thanks for listening to this episode of the michael yardney podcast which was brought to you by metropole who help their clients grow protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you? Thank you.